Well, hello and welcome to the Interaction Field series of live streams. These series of live streams are, are very special because they're all to celebrate the launch of the Interaction Field book. And that was written by our founder at Vivaldi, Eric Jochumstaller, and I'll introduce him in just a second. Um, we have got a fantastic guest on today's show. Uh, we've got Jeff Parker. Um, I will introduce him shortly as well. In fact, let's get right to it and let's speak right now to Eric. So, Eric, the book came out yesterday and it's there on the bookshelf it's behind right you. Yes. Isn't that lovely being able I to hold... I touched with care. <laughs> <laughs> All of that work and you actually get something physical to hold. At last. It's wonderful. So, so are you like him? Um, I mean, I've got a, a stack of uh, my own books in, in, in boxes and uh, a lot of my friends who are authors have got like garages filled with boxes of books. Are, are you going to end up with books around the house that you end up using these boxes to sit on because you've got so many of them? <laughs> that actually might be a good utility or good value for some of it. <laughs> At least for mine. I've read it so many times. I've written the book. I probably the next usefulness I have is, is to sit on it. <laughs> <laughs> so let's we've got a, a phenomenal guest today. Um, so uh, let me tell you, audience, a little bit about Jeff. Now, um, Jeff is professor of engineering at Dartmouth College. Um, he's also a re research fellow at MIT's Initiative for the Digital Economy, where he leads platform industry research. So that's really applicable to what we're talking about. Um, he's made significant contributions to the field of network economics and strategy as co-developer of the theory of two-sided markets. He's a co-author of the book Platform Revolution. And amongst his current research focus, his studies uh, he studies platform business strategy, which we will be probing him about <laughs> today. And he's a smart man. And to prove it, he received the 2019 Thinkers 50 Digital Thinking Award for his work on two-sided markets and the inverted firm. So I'm absolutely delighted to be able to introduce him to the show right now. Hello, Jeff. Welcome. Hello. Hi, Dave. Hi, Eric. Uh, thank you so Hi. much for having me aboard. What is Digital Thinking? Digital Thinking Award. Isn't that a, you know, it, I, I think that award has been um, established for, for quite some time. And uh, it was a real honor, frankly, to win that because it, it recognized work we've done in studying network effects for over 20 years. Um, yeah. I shouldn't say it's been that long, but uh, it was just, <laughs> It's been fun to see how things that were changing in the economy that we could observe a long time ago have become incredibly relevant and visible today. Is that, uh, Jeff, maybe we start right there. Is uh, Hemingway, you said in one of his books that things, and, and you said you worked 20 years already on this, things happen gradually uh, and then they happen suddenly. Is that is that what is happening? That yeah, I think that's exactly right, and, and it's almost um, this kind of hockey stick phenomenon. So, if we had been talking ten years ago, and I was sort of interested in platforms, I think that most industries would say that sounds like a Silicon Valley thing, and you know we can safely ignore that, and I don't really have to deal with it. And then I'd say about four or five years ago, just the explosive growth of the big tech companies, the GAFMs, um, made it so obvious that you couldn't ignore them anymore. And and so then every firm started scrambling and, and saying, well, what does this mean for us? Are these companies entering our markets? How are they going to become our partners as infrastructure providers? Um, and the growth just became too fast and too large to ignore. Well, uh, what I what I know at least is that, and that's why I wrote the book, uh, this interaction field book, is that uh, uh, a lot of companies now have come to recognize that um, that uh, these business models, platforms, digital ecosystems, is sort of a new way of creating value and sometimes exponential value versus the traditional supply chain uh, model. The pipeline model is more difficult to to extract value and create value. But what's what's interesting is that 
um, what, why I wrote the book is, is that um, there's a lot of thought about it and a lot of recognition, but making those platforms and ecosystems actually work is quite another thing. The takeoff rate is sometimes, or failure of takeoff is sometimes as high as 85%. Yeah, I think that's kind of um, kind of a, if not a secret, I think it's a, a it's a really important fact uh, that has been documented. I think by some of our colleagues, mm -hmm. David Yaffe, uh, Michael mm -hmm. Simano, Annabelle. I think have done a lot of work in that area. Yeah, uh, Annabelle Gower. So uh, it, there are some reasons. I think mm -hmm. if you look at the way that a lot of these digital transformation projects get uh, measured. They're being measured by an old set of metrics that are more applicable to kind of standard linear value chain pipeline yeah. businesses. Yeah. And so they don't look great um, on kind of traditional metrics. And before they get a chance to scale, to grow, to prove success, um, they sometimes just get shut down. Yeah. Um, and that's kind of one. And the other, I think, is that often when you start to make data more visible across the organization, and you start to open up new channels for customers, you get channel conflict. And then that starts to, and, and within the organization, and then that starts to attract the antibodies. Mm -hmm. So change that says, hey, I'm going to protect my division, my revenue streams, you know, my ability to capture revenue. And I don't, you know, I don't really care about this new startup that's even within our four walls. Yeah. Um, so that that's a big management challenge then to explain sort of across the organization, why this makes sense, um, why potentially cannibalizing a revenue stream is actually in everyone's interest. Yeah. So so there are a lot of reasons, I think, yeah. why that failure rate can, yeah. can come to pass. And so just capacity. Yeah. What I find interesting is despite uh, how hard it is and how complex, complex it is in an organization, what, what you also still see 2020, the, the time we live right now, is that the enthusiasm, uh, at least from a Wall Street perspective, uh, has not let down. In fact, the platform companies uh, either do more likely go do an IPO or platform companies are right now at the top of at least market capitalization. Uh, maximization, if you will. Uh, so, so the enthusiasm from a Wall Street side uh, happens. Can can you? I'd be curious your perspective uh, on what happens in the pandemic. Um, what happened during these times to companies? Not not necessarily the Wall Street, but maybe Main Street, if you will, yeah. real companies. Yeah, no, I think it's been really interesting, and we've uh, we've been involved actually in a, in a really neat. Um, Council on Advanced Manufacturing um, through the World Economic Forum, uh, getting a chance to interview uh, a fairly wide range of firms in what's happened in their uh, supply chain, what's happened on their demand side as a result of COVID. Um, the project started before COVID, but of course that became of immediate interest. And, and what we heard again and again, um, and I don't think this will surprise people listening, is that we saw the quote kind of uh, five years, 10 years of change were compressed into two or three months. I mean, I think people were willing to do different business model um, kind of experiments or, or just adopt different business models um, very rapidly because they had no choice. They had either a demand collapse, a supply collapse, or the flip side, a demand explosion that they were then scrambling to line up enough supply to satisfy. And so that really stressed the systems out to where they had to allow um, for innovation that would have been prevented in business as usual. Yeah. Mm. Interesting. Yeah. So can I just say here that um, for those who are watching, please, if you've got any comments, please use the chat area. We've already had some comments um, uh, already, um, but we'll be bringing the comments in later on. So if you've got any questions, please put them there. <laughs> And um, I'll let you gents carry on with the chat. <laughs> yeah. So I'm I'm interested then in in this because um, scrambling to, to scrambling to take advantage of an exploding demand side or uh, scrambling to to manage a, a shrinking supply and a shrink a, a, shr a shrinking market. I think that's what. 
that's what you see almost left and right and and i think that's a it's a good so what is is i know you are known for this concept called the inverted firm um uh, uh can you is that a model a business model that for for which which has uh, the time where the time has come for which time has come if i say this properly in english yeah. is, is the is this the model where you can deal with sudden searches in demand on one side if you will or, or shrinking shrinking parts both on on, on on both equations supply and demand yeah we, we we would argue that um so first of all let's let's just talk about the inverted firm mm -hmm. um the essential idea there is that you can provide kind of building blocks of technology, of um, contracting, financial services, um, that you then allow for others to build on top of. And, and when we talk about platforms, that's what we mean. But, but the important idea is that a lot of the value add starts to take place outside the four walls, say, of the platform sponsor firm, and is really being executed by an ecosystem partner in a much more kind of decentralized way. Um, the reason that's important is that those types of organizations that adopt that model, um, they scale a lot faster. Uh, so why does that matter in the pandemic? The reason is that kind of a traditional firm that's set up a relatively stable supply chain that then has either the demand side or the supply side get disrupted is not going to pivot as easily as one that's used to coordinating a wider set of partners, both on demand and supply side, um, and is used to having contracting relationships that are are kind of more generic um, and therefore less transaction cost um, to bring people on board. And so those are some of the reasons why those organizations that had that business model were able to pivot and scale um, more quickly. So the pivot would be finding new demand um, to match your supply to and the scale would be finding new supply um, to satisfy increasing demand. What would be a good example of that? I, I mean, I can see this, like I can see this and as an example, if, if, if I use uh, as a consulting company, if I use, if I rely merely on, on full-time staff, there is a, a years of recruiting, months of recruiting, I can't scale up demand uh, uh, as quickly versus if I use a pool of external consultants, let's say, uh, I can sort of I can see how this works in the little world of Vivaldi. But is there sort of an example that that, that comes to mind that has responded well in the pandemic, or or at least has taken the right baby steps to to make that work to to build that kind of a firm? So I think you know part of the explosion of, of the big tech. You know the, the incredible, um, the incredible market cap increases that we've seen. It's partly because they had those kind of scalable business models already in place. But I actually want to tell a story. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I want to talk about uh, food trucks um, because they're kind of fun. Um, yeah, we must have gone to our, our food truck uh, that would be located usually in the same place, and it would serve stable demand often at lunchtime. And so what happened, of course, is that during the pandemic, that demand evaporated. And those decentralized players didn't have a sensing function to detect new demand. And that actually offer, uh, allowed for a platform to come into play. And so the platform could come into play, detect the new demand, and then match supply and demand. Where with stable demand, the food trucks didn't need that sensing function. They could go to the same place, know that the same office workers, construction workers, or whoever would show up on a repetitive basis. But the new demand had a different pattern. And so it tended to be out in the suburbs and oh. it was serving not lunch demand, but business demand. And it wasn't stable because people didn't want to eat the same sort of fish tacos every night. And so the platform had to dispatch those trucks sequentially night after night to different places that's not something an individual truck owner was able to do so there's quite a bit of value that was created by becoming kind of the market maker in the middle figuring out the demand patterns and then doing the matches and so that's oh. an area where the pivot happened because a platform was able to step in 
and do that coordination. What a wonderful example that is, because I understand the food truck business. <clears throat> you know, they used to locate where my office is downtown, uh, where all the, all the workers are during the day. And now I, I was yesterday in the office. I didn't see any food trucks anymore. They all yeah. moved to, to where demand is. That's, um, so, so it's also an interesting question. Then the question becomes maybe the traditional way to think about strategy, like the competitive advantage, uh, uh, the, the world of market positioning and uh, uh, the traditional way of strategy is really more suitable for a very stable environment. But when you are in a pandemic world or in a, in a market that is accelerated as many markets are in, in, in the lives we live, pandemic or not, in, the, in that kind of a, I think they call it VUCA world, if you even will, the traditional strategy really isn't hel as helpful and 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 uh, platform strategy i think that uh, inverted firm is is sort of the business model that that um, uh, has the agility to adapt and uh, to demand changes i think that's yeah i i think we would argue that i mean it's not that kind of um the stable five forces model if you will that's that's been quite robust in, in strategic thinking yeah is is wrong in any sense it's that it's incomplete incomplete yeah and especially in these sort of dynamic environments where things are changing really rapidly it's hard to say oh this is a competitor this is a customer well they might you know your competitors might well nest on top of your system and be customers your customers might end up being in some sense competitors so those aren't stable relationships um but more importantly i think there's also this notion of, of network effects that don't get captured in these kind of stable supply chain arrangements. And network effects are where as the number of users increases or changes, um, the value of the overall system to the individual users also changes. And so that dependency is important because it can create sort of nonlinear growth and nonlinear um, value creation. Yeah. And that needs to be taken into effect into account rather um, for both conceptualizing when you launch the system, but also then how do you measure it and how do you manage it? Is is that is that just on that network effect? Um, is that um, advantage more attainable today um, as we speak, or versus maybe when you started mm -hmm. with uh, thinking about two-sided marketplaces, or what is the cause of why that network effect is so powerful and so much yeah, so important? A great question, and I'd actually go back to the medieval village market. <laughs> you know, it, it, network effects were always there. I mean, mm -hmm. the medieval village market wouldn't have existed if people didn't find value in bringing their goods to the central market. Um, and then creating exchanges. I think what's different now is that all the reasons why that medieval market didn't scale were transaction costs. You had transport costs, you had, um, oh gosh, the local tastes. Um, and, and Currency, you didn't know how to pay. Currencies. Exactly, so lots of reasons why you would, these markets would find themselves bounded mm -hmm. and over time with with the kind of rise of information and uh, you know, compute, computation and communications technologies, the, the transaction costs are falling. And so what that allows for is relatively small network effects to start to get aggregated and become incredibly powerful where before they would have been swamped out mm -hmm. by high transaction costs. Mm -hmm. But isn't, if I may say this in a more simple way, transaction costs, um, isn't, it, isn't it that digital, digital technology has basically made, uh, have made those transaction costs largely disappearing or at least uh, uh, reduce the transaction costs, which increases then the, the, the value through network effects, value creations through network effects? Yeah, I think that's yeah. A, it's another way of saying it, right? No, yeah. I think we're on exactly the same yeah. page. Um, and there's a corollary or, or sort of a follow on to what you're saying, which is that a lot of the kind of value that we're consuming in the economy is coming from things that are delivered digitally. And so in the past, um, a lot of what we might exchange 
had mostly a physical kind of uh, representation to it. But to the extent that we can, you know, consume information that's all delivered digitally or our entertainment yeah. is digital, um, then it's easier to, to aggregate that yeah. kind of demand and supply and do the matching. And, and again, at much lower transaction yeah. costs, so then yeah. you get scale. So here's here's my question. Then look, we live in New York. Uh, I the other day I walked down Fifth Avenue. There are all these beautiful fashion ho fashion uh, uh, apparel uh, stores you you pass by, and 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 you know you look down on Fifth Avenue. Many of them are boarded up, uh, and many of them say, say out of business. So the the fashion industry, you know, the typical companies like. Uh, uh, you know, Zara, Ralph Lauren, uh, you know, all the way to high end Oscar de la Renta, or let's say, um, the fashion companies tend to, tend to go through that massive change uh, on the demand side uh, and the supply side. How, do you have some illustrations from that industry or do you, how is it working in that industry? Do you think platforms and digital ecosystems are now sort of like, in the rise or is there a movement toward those? And yeah, it's a great it? question. And uh, we've got a couple of examples that came out uh, of the World Economic Forum project. And I think what we're seeing is the firms, and you can kind of go back to the investments that companies have made in digitalization and um, sort of having much better visibility in their supply chain. Uh, but the companies that were able to take that end-to-end -end visibility and go all the way from, say, their manufacturing floor or their supply chain and then get it up to kind of the marketing side and um, adjust on the demand side, if you could end-to-end -end connect those dots, then you were able to much more quickly pivot or produce things that the market wanted um, on, a, on, a, on a dime, if you will. And we actually had some really neat examples. So, uh, so interestingly, Polo, Ralph Lauren, the firm you just mentioned, um, has has adopted some of these much more um, kind of responsive technologies, and as a result, has been able to pivot a lot more than some of the firms you might have mentioned. And which I don't know the specifics of those, but the fact that these places are boarded up is not a great sign. Yeah, yeah, but I think that's that's the key. The key I think you're talking about is 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 to is to is the interactions that take place along the entire the entire supply chain. So so when you think of platforms, you often just think of um, you think of uh, buyers and uh, I mean riders and drivers. Uh, you think of hosts like me who who wants to get rid of a spare room uh, apartment here in New York City and a traveler with Airbnb. But what you're talking about is a much larger set of interactions that you need to enable along the fashion uh, value chain, if you will, uh, for, all the way from source. And the better that that in the action field, I call it, <laughs> uh, works, the the more you you enable that that responsiveness or the agility that that fashion requires. Is that that's what you said? Yeah, I think that's a fair a fair way to put it. And and you're right in that you can think about sort of your Uber and Airbnb examples. Those are a little bit simpler in many ways in terms mm -hmm. of the transaction they're trying to 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 power and create. Um, yeah. Whereas some of these these manufacturing systems are a lot more complex, but if you have that complete visibility from end to end, then that allows for the firms to connect different players in, because that visibility also implies that you've got interfaces that are you can you know connection points, APIs, application program yep. interfaces that are between the boundaries yes. of the system. And then you should be able to scale as you can add not just internal resources, but external resources. Um, and that's one of the reasons why they can pivot. And an important point there is that now you can start to match an appropriate operating model, which would be one that's a little bit more decentralized to one of these business models, which allows you to run markets as well as kind of a, a pipeline. Um, yeah. And that's important to get sort of the operating side and the business model side aligned. And often they get kind of mashed together. But if you pull them apart, then you can start to, to think, well, is this business model where we're going to run a market and potentially take a percentage 
going to work if our supply chain is sort of locked in cement. Well, that doesn't really make any sense. But if it's more an, an open system where we're inviting external participants in, okay, now that operating model and that business model can start to complement one another. Now, now, and we, we are back to the inverted firm because the more you can connect uh, uh, third party players, that gives you the scalability, but that, that also basically enables uh, or creates the inverted firm in some ways. So why is it not happening? Why, why is, is uh, what is your sort of like your, your beef with why this is, why some companies, let's say Ralph Lauren are sort of experimenting and going that direction. Why, why is it not happening wholesale? What, what, what hinders companies? Uh, is it, is it the leadership of companies themselves? Is it the mindset they have is, what, where do you see that the biggest? Well, part of it is the structure. I mean, let's, let's, well, let's first of all, talk about some of the enabling infrastructure. So in order, in order to do that inverted firm model, um, there are a lot of assumptions there, and a lot of that is going to be this end-to-end -end digital um, kind of visibility. That assumes a common data model, right? That assumes that we have sort of worked horizontally across the across the enterprise, and then we're able to plug in at different points. Well, a lot of companies just don't work that way. Um, they built up through acquisition, or they grew through verticals that address specific industries, and then they built their capabilities, um, their you know sort of manufacturing, their supply chain, their marketing, mm -hmm. product management, and design. Yeah, serve those industries, and so you end up with a bunch of silos. Um, yeah, and then pandemic comes, things go unstable, and you're dealing with silos that don't coordinate easily across. So I think part of it is just is historical, and that's one of the reasons why. You, you, the quote digital natives end up being a lot more nimble in these situations because they don't have that kind of legacy vertical, you know, organization. Yeah, absolutely. Um, now, this is a good time, I think, for me to come in with some questions uh, from people who have been watching. And I think going on that, you were sort of talking really about um, leadership there and the role of leadership in, in, in this. So we've got here. A statement to see if you gents agree with it. Um, Stephen's saying that makes me think that you need great vision, belief, and discipline within a business to really take advantage of interaction field thinking. So for looking at, at companies that are working within the platform economy, is it all really down to leadership? Is, is it the, the leadership that, that, that from the very top that needs to be involved in this? Or can people further down the pyramid start dabbling? I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll throw that one uh, over to you, Jeff. <laughs> sure. I, I, I mean, you know, I don't want to. I don't want to say that it always has to be sort of a board level CEO um, type of initiative, because I do think that some companies, especially if they start, um, I don't want to say pilot, but think of joint ventures, um, so that you're a little bit protected from some of the funding um, uncertainty. Uh, that an individual firm would impose on you, have a shot. But I'd say once you get um, into uh, sort of taking revenues away from major parts of the existing organization uh, or potentially competing with them, then you're in a, a, a pretty top level management kind of a conversation because you really will attract a lot of uh, a lot of antibodies in the organization that will prevent that from taking off. Um, so there have to be ways that it makes sense. Um, incentives have to be aligned. People have to be rewarded for um, helping this new thing scale, even at the cost of their own current kind of revenue streams. I mean, if you were to think of the car industry, for example, um, trying to make to to eliminate the assumptions that you just mentioned for the inverted firm for uh, uh, for a larger network or in the action field. Um, it's just like, to, just like, for example, you say like common data uh, data uh, uh, points, um, a, a common data model or an end-to-end -end thing. It's just in, inconceivable. You know, you have, you have a dealership network, you have, uh, you have a you have the silos. You look at financial services, the line of businesses. They're almost always 
um, um, uh, compartmentalized. So, so it'll be without uh, a level of um, a level of the organization. You almost will be impossible. It will, will almost be impossible to create the the the, the 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 foundation for building this inverted firm uh, model. You know, seems to me. Yes, and, and, and I think that point about working with an incumbent or an existing firm, um, that's where the, the scale of those investments to go horizontal is quite a bit larger than a small firm that starts, finds a niche industry, can kind of test and pivot and find its, its sort of minimum viable product and, and product market fit um, before it attracts a bunch of competition and before it attracts a bunch of, of resistance. So a big yeah. firm has a different problem. Yeah, yeah. And they kind of have to solve for a couple of things. One is is the efficiency that you hope you would gain by adopting this common data model and being able to eliminate redundant kind of technology investments. And that can be one reason that you could end up being able to justify what could be, you know, multi-billion dollar investments for a big enough company. Uh, and then, of course, you're really laying the foundation for what you would hope would be future revenue streams, future businesses, future mm -hmm. growth. Um, and then you can imagine how you try to make that business case. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's gonna be a bit complicated. Now we've had a, a fantastic challenge here um, from Manfredi uh, Sosoli de Bianchi. I, I, I apologize, Manfredi, if I've pronounced your name incorrectly. I'm just a poor Scotsman. Um, Manfredi, you said that, would you agree that as network effects are becoming more mainstream, they have less of an impact than 10 years ago? Today, if we start with a marketplace, six months later, there's a copycat. So, so was it that networks of network effects, did they have a peak <laughs> 10 years ago and that now it's getting harder as everyone's trying to compete in the same marketplace? Let me, let me kind of take it. So I love the observation. Um, I don't think they're even remotely less important. It, but I think the point there is you're likely to attract competition faster where, where because these business models are better understood, um, if somebody sees it taking off, then you get the copycat. Fine, but now you're still in a battle to the death potentially. And if you can get scale and get large enough, then you're able to um, sort of create more value for your user base for both supply and demand side. And then that, that ultimately ends up helping you grow more quickly. I think, I think the question is, and this is an open question, can we, uh, will we see more differentiation that allows for um, kind of specialized firms to serve very specific markets in ways that the giant tech companies will have trouble competing with. Um, and it's a really important question. It gets into antitrust um, issues because, and, and it gets into data ownership and you know how are we gonna deploy things like artificial intelligence and machine learning and will we end up just having a, a handful of firms or will that technology diffuse down to specific industries that can then deploy it? Mm. Well. So Eric, what's your what's your take on this about the, the fact that there's a low level bar potentially for people to come in and to, to be copycats? Is there is there well, more risk um, with, with, with coming up with a, a fresh idea using an interaction field model? Well, you know, my my, my feeling is that uh, if I, you know, if you look at my book, I, I talk about agriculture, then I talk about retail Alibaba in, in China, then I talk about um, uh, uh, Lego and the consumer products like Lego for kids they are and adults. Um, then I talk about um, Klöckner, which is metal, metal trading. Then I talk about healthcare. Then I talk about automotive. So I actually think what, what Jeff said is like this distribution is taking place, number one. And number two, if you look at network effects merely in terms of, of um, uh, the number of users that add value that makes the, the product more valuable, then yes, there is there is uh, a very quickly a commodification uh, by 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 others uh, uh, joining in. But network effects are created through interactions, and interactions also uh, have not only uh, an, a quality to it and and a uh, uh, and a volume to it; they also have meaning. 
uh, and and this is where what, what what Jeff said is is about differentiation. So if 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 you think through what is what am I really solving for from a consumer? What is the framing? That's why I call it the first step in my book. What is framing? And then once you have that framing, how what is the differentiation you want to achieve? What's that brand promise? Which if you start there, and then you take the second step. What what um, uh, 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 Jeff and, and Marshall has written the book and, and, and Sangeet has written the book, the Platform Revolution book, namely how you design the platform and ecosystems and how do you create network effects through interactions, through architecture, through governance. If you do that as a second step, then you, real, then you really solve for that differentiation that, that, that I think Manfredi sort of was worried about. So there's, uh, you can still in small, in, uh, you can still build blood for, uh, strong brands and companies using the platform business model in this way. Mm. Hope, I hope and that was it. If you don't understand this, uh, please read my book. No, no, no buy my book. <laughs> <laughs> there's, a, there's a few dollars I get. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> shameless, uh, shameless and we've got promotion. The other, book I the other book I recommend, you know, before my book, because it's a more important one, it's been written by Jeff. So here you go. <laughs> <laughs> we should all be plugging our books on here. Um, and then we've got time for one uh, last question here from... Uh, Professor Dr. Christopher Morash. Again, apologize if, if I have butchered your name there. As consumers, we manage about 85% of our relationships with companies online. Are companies still failing on omnichannel? That's actually a great question. Um, and I think it, we can use the pandemic as sort of one framing. I think the companies that um, thrived or, or you know, were able to pivot were those who were able to go omni-channel um, and they were able to literally work across all the different ways and touch points to the end customers. So, um, you know, are they failing? Uh, well, failing is the right word, but it's still awfully complex as a consumer um, to deal with all of these different systems. And so I do think there's an opening um, for intermediation, for aggregation. Um, and that automatically means there's an opening for disintermediation. So I think uh, we're going we're gonna to still see a lot of uh, a lot of innovation. We're going to see, in effect, platforms that will come in and either organize other platforms or organize businesses. So I don't think we've seen the last word in in the economics and the the change in industry at all. Um, so a great question. I'm not sure I, I sort of nailed exactly. Um, I, I have asked, but. I have a good example. You know, in yeah. this on this channel, we interviewed jo Julie Röhm. She's the chief marketing and chief experience officer for Party City. And Party City is uh, sells balloons and party supplies by the big box before the pandemic, and and because nobody would either have parties anymore the usual way or would actually be able to go to a store they needed to close 900 stores for some time they pivoted into a into that omnichannel solution uh, and I think that much to what what uh, uh, Jeff mentioned earlier they they instead of just pivoting and says like how are we going to do it so that there were some early steps like a, a curbside you buy online uh, and then cur curbside you can pick it up the employees or the, the, the store manager would walk out this what out the and, and actually deliver it to your car so so you don't have to go inside the store but then what they did is, is they they developed a party delivery system so like you can you can actually instead of just buy the supplies they organize your entire party they use a fleet and they use hertz as an example so a third party partner in order to deliver party supplies to to your ba backyard let's say and, and have the party in your backyard um so there's a, a pivot from to from almost like a, a massive pivot toward the omni-channel experience um, uh, uh, that they were achieved in a relatively short period of time. And then take it the next step to what Jeff calls the, the, the inverted firm. So it's a, it's a beautiful case study. You, you, you can listen on, on this channel. Um. Mm. So time to, time to wrap up. And Jeff, I'd like to 
uh, it hit you with a sticky question, which is that any companies that would be looking, that are interested in your inverted firm uh, idea that you've been talking about, um, what would be the first step, the first practical step they could take towards embracing this inverted firm approach? So, so I think you're right. That's a uh, that's a good question. So, I think you look across the operations, you see where there's a lot of variety in what a market is demanding that the system as currently configured is having a hard time addressing. And then those are areas where you could say, well, if I could extend um, the ability to create value uh, to a broader ecosystem of players and connect them in, I'd be able to capture a lot more of this market that I've had to segment and only serve you know, specific pieces of it. So that's sort of part one. Um, and then I think part two is examining the parts of the system that have relatively more digital kind of content in terms of the value add, because that's going to be another area where the transaction costs of connecting um, external players are going to be a lot lower. Uh, and that's sort of the places to start. And then I'd say you start looking at the physical pieces of the system and what you deliver, and then asking, well, where are there opportunities to layer on additional value that's still primarily digital, um, because that will scale more easily. Um, so those are a few places that you'd start if you take kind of any organization and start examining it and peeling it apart and saying, you know, where are the parts going to be that you would you would start to build ecosystems around? Mm. That's fantastic. Jeff, thank you so much for your time. That's been, it's been wonderful. Um, I, and I just want to say for those of you who are watching, thank you for watching, whether you're watching again or whether you're watching live. Those of you who have given uh, us questions, we love you very much. Uh, I love you. Um, you remember that you can uh, you can order right here. <laughs> Look, so 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 here we go. There, platform can revolution. Get, um, there's a book for you to order. I, and interaction field. Can I humbly put my book next to this book here? <laughs> <laughs> I just want to congratulate you. Uh, it is no small feat um, to take a set of learning and mm -hmm. to really sit down and distill it. Um, so. Really thrilled to be part of a uh, part of your event here today, and congratulations! Um, absolutely uh, great, absolutely great. <laughs> absolutely great. So much, you know. Absolutely been an, an admirer of the work. I wouldn't have otherwise continued sort of pushing the envelope here in my book. And so, thank you so much. Thank you so much. <laughs> Wonderful. So, Jeff, Eric. Thank you so much for uh, the last 40 minutes or so. For those who have been watching, you are awesome. Uh, we're going to be back tomorrow uh, with uh, David Collis. Um, so please join us then. Um, look after yourself. Stay safe. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.